Hello everyone. Welcome back to part two of this training on drought monitoring, prediction and projection using NASA Earth System data. Today we will focus on drought prediction using NASA sub-seasonal to seasonal or S2S predictions. And we have a guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Andrea Molod from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, she is the lead and in developing S2S modeling and prediction data. In the previous session, we saw drought monitoring data and tools uh, using Earth observations. And today we are just now going to focus on uh, model predictions on sub-seasonal to seasonal scale. Um, just a note here about homework. Uh, it will be posted on uh, 1st August, which is the last day of the training and the homework will be due on August 15. Um, and the certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignments before the given due date, that's 15th of August. Also, as we will talk later, there is a hands-on exercise that will be given to you that you can analyze some of the S2S data using QGIS. So we'll talk about it later. Just a brief review of part one. Uh, we had an overview of various types of droughts, uh, that is meteorological, agricultural, and hydrological. Um, and earth observations, which are used for drought monitoring, uh, include precipitation, soil moisture, vegetation index, temperature, groundwater. Uh, we briefly saw which satellites and sensors are used for these parameters um, and which drought they indicate. Uh, for example, precipitation from GPM, deficiency in precipitation indicates meteorological drought. Uh, also other weather parameters including surface temperature, uh, it's obtained from Terra and Aqua Modis, S&P, PJPSS, Weirs, and Lancet um, TRS or Thermal uh, Infrared Sensor. Um, these satellites are also used to, to detect agricultural drought because they're used to calculate normalized difference vegetation index and um, evapotranspiration from um, optical spectral data. So same sensors are used and Landsat operational land imager is also useful for that. Um, hydrological drought, uh, which results in, in soil moisture depletion and uh, depletion groundwater as well, and two satellites, uh, Soil Moisture Active Passive and GRACE Follow-On, they provide these data sets. We also had an overview of drought indices, including Standardized Precipitation Index, SPI, uh, Palmer Drought Severity Index, or PTSI, and Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, and DVI. Uh, the SPI, which is calculated based on precipitation data, uh, it, is, uh, it shows number of standard deviations by which the observed rainfall deviates from the long-term mean at a given location. The PDSI is similar um, deviation, but it's calculated based on precipitation and temperature data and also uses a water balance model. NTVI is calculated from red and near infrared wavelengths and detects green vegetation. Then we had overview of trout.gov and US trout monitor portals from our NOAA colleagues, Kelsey Satellino and Brad Pugh. They showed features of these drought monitoring tools over the US also uh, global drought conditions in drought.gov uh, were covered. Uh, we also looked at different categories of drought, how they are derived from uh, percentile values of various parameters such as soil moisture, precipitation, PDSI, etc. Then we had Dr. Tucker. Uh, he talked about how NTVI and solar-induced fluorescence can be used to see drought conditions for food security. And he showed NDVI anomalies for selected regions, both maps and time series. Finally, Sean McCartney demonstrated how to calculate SPI and VCI, uh, that is Vegetation Condition Index, based on NDVI, um, as indicators of drought using Google Earth Engine. He focused on Zimbabwe and showed how um, SPI and VCI can help in monitoring drought. This brings us to today's session on S2S predictions. 
overall objectives for today are that by the end of this session, uh, we will recognize functionality of NASA's sub-seasonal to seasonal forecast system and data and assess evolving drought conditions using given S2S temperature and precipitation prediction data for a region of interest. So we'll start with description of NASA's S2S forecast system and data and then we will have a demonstration of analysis of S2S predictions of temperature and precipitation in QGIS. So next we will start with S2S forecast system and data and before I introduce our guest speaker, here is how to ask questions. So please put all your questions in the question box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. And feel free to enter your questions as we go. We will try to get to all the questions during the question and answer session. Um, the remainder of the questions will be answered in the question and answer document, which will be posted on the training website about a week after the training. With that, I want to invite Dr. Andrea Molod to talk about S2S predictions. Um, Dr. Molod, she is a research physical scientist here at Goddard Space Flight Center in Global Modeling and Assimilation Office, or GMAO. Uh, she leads a seasonal and decadal prediction group, uh, managing the development of the next generation atmosphere ocean coupled seasonal prediction system. She also is involved in development of GEOS 5 general circulation model physical parameterizations and she is GMAO lead of the coupled chemistry model development effort with members of the atmospheric chemistry and dynamics branch here at Goddard. So with that, uh, I ask Dr. Molot to talk about S2S predictions. Thank you, Andrea, take it away. So thank you, Amita. For, for the introduction. Um, and again, as, as she just said, I'm Andrea Molod, and I'm the lead of the um, NASA Global Modeling and Assimilation Office uh, Subseasonal Prediction Group. Um, I have the list of a lot of names down here, and different people on this list have contributed in one way or another, but deserve recognition for their contributions um, to this work that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, so, just a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to talk a little bit about what seasonal prediction is and how it fundamentally differs from weather. Um, we're, we're all kind of used to looking at and understanding what a weather forecast is. Seasonal prediction is, is a little bit of a different thing. i um, going to talk a little bit about our user community, um, who we give data to in a near real time sense and what they're doing with it. It's, uh, it's quite a, a varied list of, of users. Um, going to talk to you a little bit about the model features, and I don't mean the technical details of physical parameterizations or ocean models or things like that. I'm talking to you about, you know, I, as I will describe, seasonal is a, a, a fundamentally stochastic uh, animal. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the ensemble forecasts and what, what that tells us about reliability and for anticipated skill. Then I'm going to devote a little time to talking about the output, the, the details of the output information, what we output, what it looks like, where you can find it, things like that. Um, a note here, because some of the slides are going to talk about different versions of this system. We're about literally next month, we're going to make our transition from a GSS to S2 system that's been running since about 2017 to our new one, which is GSS to S3. Has a lot of upgrades. We are delighted with the improved forecast skill. I'm going to give you a little teeny glimpse of that and uh, a huge extensive retrospective forecast suite. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit <laughs> about what the potential benefit for users is of that. Um, so, first question NASA. Satellites, satellites measuring the Earth, but why is NASA interested in developing and maintaining a subseasonal, a subseasonal seasonal prediction project? What, what's the interest here? So the idea is that we use these models in conjunction with satellite and in situ observations to study and predict the phenomena. And the idea here is that our experimentation allows us to explore how to better use NASA or other satellite data 
to improve forecast skill. So to that end, we maintain a state-of-the-art system and we're continually doing experimentation on what happens if we add this data, was, does that help the skill? Um, and so we have a history, a long history of doing this, um, beginning before the current one. Every one of them had a coupled model, some kind of coupled data assimilation for some kind of reanalysis and um, some kind of an ensemble perturbation strategy. Um, the first bullet there, what we call pre-GEOS, that um, started the, the, the references actually here, but this project started quite some time ago. This was actually a model that didn't extend from pole to pole that fundamentally just covered the tropics, but was still used for seasonal prediction. The GEOS S2S1 20, 2012, our version two came out in 2017 uh, at higher spatial resolution. And our newest one is scheduled for release um, sometime next month. Um, and so just wanna talk a little bit about this phenomenon of seasonal prediction. So. The first sentence may sound a little technical, but it's not. The climate system is what we call the forced dissipative nonlinear dynamical system. It, it's red. There's red noise all over the system. But we also understand that it's chaotic. And so we've all learned that because there's chaos in the atmosphere, after a certain amount of time, we can't predict things anymore. Okay. So if that's the case, and we're talking about a week to two week predictability, what, what is this seasonal thing about? Okay. And so the seasonal takes advantage of a few things. The tropics are so strongly determined by the, by the ocean underneath it that it's not that sensitive to the initial conditions. So it's less chaotic. Um, and so basically, the tropical, the, the tropical ocean also is like an integrated impact of what the overlying atmosphere does. And so basically, because they evolve slowly, the ocean and the land too, this also extends this predictability out. So essentially, we should be able to predict seasonal scale things in the tropics at least, for as long as we can predict the ocean temperature, which is up to a year or so, okay? The key to this whole thing is a, is a concept that's called signal to noise ratio, okay? How much of the variability is predictable? That's your signal. How much is not? Okay, that's your noise. And so the predictable part of this depends on these what we call sources of predictability. The ocean is one big one, okay? The rest of it is generally unpredictable and it's noise. So the whole game of seasonal prediction is how to maximize this signal to noise ratio. What do we do to get that signal to stand out from the noise? So in addition to the ocean, there are other sources of predictability, so-called sources of predictability. A lot of these are regular oscillating patterns in the atmosphere and in the ocean. You can think of something like El Nino that we all know that more or less every five, six years, we're seeing variations, okay? So as we see that we're headed into a, an El Nino phase, which is a warm sea surface temperature in the, in the tropical Pacific, all of a sudden our prediction skill, predictability is better. And there are other of these kinds of oscillating motions. The Manjulian oscillation is one, and each one of this happens on different kinds of timescales. And so this gives us predictability. And then the question is, can we cash in on this to actually get prediction skill out to multi-year timescales? So here's back to this concept of signal to noise. What is it actually that's predictable? Can we predict the temperature at three o'clock in the afternoon, three months from now? The answer is no, okay? So what is it that's predictable? We're talking about probabilistic measures, um, how many air quality exceedance days are we gonna have next month? We're talking about spatial averages. We're talking about time averages, okay? This is a fundamentally statistical endeavor. And so we must have ensembles of forecasts to predict the probabilities. 
This also allows us to assess what something that we call reliability. Okay, I'm going to talk about that briefly. Um, forecasts also need some kind of calibration. We adjust for model bias and things like that. Calibrated forecasts are more reliable. So the error that we expect them to have is the error that they're going to have. And this time averaging turns out that the longer the lead time, the longer we the time averaging in order to get something predictable at these lead times. And so the idea is at whether we don't do any of the averaging, yes, we can predict the weather at two o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow. Okay. By the time we get to the one to two week averaging, the, the sub seasonal leads three, four weeks out, one to two weeks, seasonal is monthly averages. And if we're looking at decadal prediction, we have to do annual mean averages. So is next year's annual mean temperature going to be higher or lower than normal? Those are the kinds of metrics that we're talking about here. Um, so here are some of the, the users of our current system that we produce systems in near real time, which means uh, essentially on the 6th of every month, we're producing the forecast from that month to go forward nine months out. So there are some multi-model forecasts and intercomparisons. These multi-model um, intercomparisons and multi-model forecasts are always more accurate. They're even more accurate than the best contributing model to the multi-model ensemble, always, okay? Um, we send things to a, a Korean intercomparison. There's some stuff at, at um, the Columbia University. We send them the El Nino indices. There's an atmospheric river intercomparison project that actually California water resources managers are using to predict precipitation. Sea ice prediction, drought briefings, okay, and sea level prediction, okay? Now, we don't have the capacity right now to just take our entire forecast and dump them out. And so these are collections that are available, data sets that are available upon request that we are now generating in near real time for these groups and we post them on our FTP site. Um, we also have a few operational forecasts that are taking our output from our seasonal forecast and using it as input. And so we've got the drought forecast for the FuseNet program. We've got the folks at uh, Tennessee Valley Authority using it for water resources forecasting. And there's a group in Mekong River Basin, also water resources. And then we have a bunch of people using, running, trying to get experimental forecasts done with our system. We are the only near real time system right now anywhere in the world that predicts aerosol. And so the folks are using it for controlling dust sources in the US. Um, we have a landslide prediction group within Goddard. Um, there's a group based on the connection between dust and meningitis outbreaks that are taking our forecast and making forecasts of those outbreaks, ecological foresting, pest population models, crop models, et cetera. Um, we also, in addition to the ones that we're already in touch with, we also envision that we could be using this to reach a very a much larger uh, different user communities. Certainly applications in the healthcare field that we have not been able to make connections. And what I said before, we can predict seasonal anomalies of air quality, number of exceedance days, or other metrics that we would work with potential users to figure out what, what to send them. And then obviously spread of disease associated with dust and rainfall and things like that. Municipal planners, winter snow anomaly forecasts, Right now, they're basing it off some climatology in a lot of municipalities and making rather expensive decisions about snowplow trucks at the beginning of the winter. Forecasts of rainfall, soil or moisture anomalies for more applications of water resources. And because of the large ensemble size, we have a lot of interest in this and expanding interest from the, from the scientific community to use this to study predictability. Um, and just a brief note about what I said before about the interactive aerosol model. It, we're the only game in town for this, for interactive aerosol model. There are other centers that are testing this and have seen some potential benefits, but right now the near real time is us. In addition, we include an aspect in our model that not only gets us the aerosol prediction, but it lets us also understand 
how the aerosols may be affecting the clouds and the rainfall. And so under certain circumstances, this really helps us with prediction of, of cloudiness and rainfall. Um, an example would be um, the dust that comes off of Africa impacts the development of tropical cyclones in the Atlantic that season. And we are properly able to capture that. So we use an aerosol model called GoCard, the so-called interaction with cloud interaction. And basically this has shown to result in credible forecasts of air quality, aerosol optical depth and an aerosol based particulate matter 2.5 micron. And in some regions, basically if, if we're dominated by smoke, we're, we're out of luck, but any place else other than that, we're good. We've also seen an increase in the skill of two meter temperature and cloud water ice at moments when these effects are important. Um, and so there are, there's a group here that are, that are studying this. Certainly if anybody's interested in details, uh, please reach out, I'll put you in touch with Donny van Barahona. Um, and just a word a little bit about what I talked about with the reliability and this ensemble business. Um, we're going to we're going to evaluate the confidence. I'm calling it confidence here. The word is reliability. Okay, we're going to evaluate the reliability of the forecast by comparing the ensemble spread and the mean error. What we would hope is that the ensemble spread matches the mean error. So if we make a forecast and the ensembles are all over the place, we're going to tell you we're not so certain about that forecast. If we make an ensemble forecast and the ensemble spread is tight and all of the ensemble members are telling us the same thing, we better be pretty confident that that's the case. For S2S2, we found that over North American land in particular, that was spot on. If you look at the curves on the right, if you look at the two on the right, precipitation North America and two meter temperature Europe, that curves that represent the error the spread is in the blue line and the green line is the mean error. Those curves are very close. That's telling us that in general, when the error is going to be, when the spread is small, the error is small. Over the tropics, version two um, did not do so well with this. And we've made some upgrades for version three that this is now spot on as well. And on the left, I have a little schematic of what, what we want our ensemble to do. If we look on the left of that schematic below under the heading of good ensemble, we're basically talking about an ensemble spread that, whoops, um, we're, we're looking about a, a mean, the green line is the mean error and the blue line is the ensemble spread and the black lines are the sort of probabilities, the largest and smallest probabilities of the observations, okay? We need our ensemble spread. The truth is that is that red dotted line, okay? And so what we need is we need our ensembles to stay within the truth, within a certain distance of the truth, okay? As opposed to the one on the right that I would call a bad ensemble that has the truth somewhere far away, the mean error is huge, the ensemble spread is small. We regard that as a bad ensemble. So we're just trying to make the characteristics of the ensemble do a better a better job here. Okay. Um, so what did we do for ensembles? Um, the motivation for the change was what I showed you before. Our tropical Pacific, we're talking about, we called it too confident because we our error was was bigger than our spread. Okay. That says we're too confident. Our spread was too small. We made a bigger, bigger mistake and we can't have that. And then later in the forecast, it turns out that they were underconfident. We were saying the spread was gonna be huge, but our error was small. We changed our entire ensemble perturbation strategy in order to get this better, okay? In addition to that, in the extra tropics, high latitudes, Europe mostly, but other places too, we were lower than some of the best models out there for S2S2 because we had too small an ensemble size. We had 10 member ensembles for seasonal prediction. And there's a clear evidence from this paper by Scaife et al 2018 and others that the skill in these regions at these lead times 
increases with ensemble size. So we increased our ensemble size to 40. Okay. Also, this dependence of ensemble size doesn't extend to the tropics. In the tropics, we're talking about the this, this sea surface temperature and this ensemble size doesn't help us. So beyond a certain month, we're, we're reducing the ensemble. Okay. Um, and so what do we want these perturbations to do? The ensemble perturbations, we want them to capture the things that are gonna have the error grow quickly. So if we have um, a structure like the ones that we're looking down at the bottom. So this is in the ocean, the horizontal axis is longitude at the numbers that we see, the vertical axis is depth of the ocean starting at zero and going down, okay? And so what we're looking here is the depth of the ocean mixed layer, the thermocline, that we know is deeper in the West Pacific and shallower in the East Pacific. That tilted structure looks like that. And so if we can make ensemble perturbations that are tickling something that looks like that kind of a structure, we know that we're gonna capture the variations in that thermocline in, in our ensemble spread, which is what we want, okay? If the variations are gonna be big, we're gonna make a big mistake, small, small mistake. And so we basically have these fast growing structures that we're looking to have those be the ones that we tickle. And we have a mix of them running throughout the forecasts. And this we found gave us a much better reliability estimate especially in the tropics than, than what we had before. Okay, so with all of that in place, our seasonal prediction suite, um, we run forecasts out for nine months. We issue forecasts every five days for the sub-seasonal, for the, for the out to a month lead time. Um, for monthlies, we're issuing them once a month. We have 40 ensemble members for the first three months, and then we sub-select from there and run out for the remaining six with only 10. And this is, you know, basically we're looking to get the biggest bang for our buck for the computations that we have, the computational uh, space that we have. And so the 40 gets us a lot of what we want beyond the first couple of months, the first three months, the predictability in the extra tropics is gone. And we stay with only 10 members for the tropics for El Nino forecasts, and that's all we need, okay? Um, we have a coupled assimilation called GI Ocean that we have our retrospective initial forecasts from. Retrospective forecasts ran from 91 to 2024. The near real time conditions are coming from our coupled reanalysis with this name, GI Ocean NRT. And again, once a month, these are issued more or less the fifth or sixth of the month. Um, and now just a little peek at some of the improvements that we saw in the forecast skill that we're really liking. So this is a metric that we call the anomaly correlation. So we're measuring the month to month variations of the temperature, higher, lower than normal, et cetera. And this anomaly correlation measures the correlation of the predicted and the forecasted anomalies for each month. And this is over the span of our retrospective forecast periods that we use for this. Across the top, we have June on the left and January global view on the right. And across the bottom, we have the new system, again, June on the left and global view of January on the right. And we're, the deeper reds that we're seeing in that lower left picture, especially in some of the Western US regions, that very small region of really crappy skill with the blues and the whites um, is smaller and we have deeper reds also on the East Coast, and we're liking that. In the Northern Hemisphere winter, the skill over the US is substantially better. We're seeing those reds in there, and we're seeing whites and dark pinks for the, for the January from S to S2. So we've looked at this, we've looked at many, many, many other metrics. Anybody interested in any specific metric can come and talk to me, but we're, we're very happy with the skill. Um, and so let me switch gears a little bit now and talk about our output. And this includes how the output is organized, what's available, 
the file specification document, what that is and when that's going to be released for S2S3, which is not yet, and where to find files that we stage for users. Okay, so S2S2 forecast is available if anybody's still interested in a period of retrospective forecast from 81 to 2020 and near real time from actually 2018 onward. S2S3 is available from 91 to 2024. Uh, the World Meteorological Organization has changed their base climatology period from 91 to 2020. And so going back earlier than 91 was very difficult. Um, we have an extensive amount of output. There's no way that we can just post it all and have people just grab it. And so the current practice is that users request data to be staged into specific collections and specific data sets for them. And the person to uh, request this is by sending me an email. Okay, so collections. We have a concept in GS that we call collections. And here's an example of what a collection entails. Collection for us entails a name on the left. ATM is a three digit identifier that says that these are atmospheric fields. INST says instantaneous. Six hour, six hour frequency, global in scope, a Latlon grid at essentially half degree and 49 pressure levels in the vertical. The specification for each collection basically has what I said there that the name is indicating, gives you the list of what those 49 pressure levels are that these atmospheric fields are available at, and then a list of the fields themselves. So for each one of our collections, we have a specification that's like this, that will appear in a, uh, with a little bit more detail even than this, but this is the way that we tell our model what to output. Our model output is totally flexible. We can configure this however we want. This is how it's configured for S2S3. Um, and just for you to see, here's a whole list of our collections. And except for that first digit three letter identifier, we have prime average or instantaneous. We have the temporal frequency of the available output. Right now, everything is global. And a lot of things are output on that half degree grid, but our ocean runs on a quarter degree grid. And so we have some things from the ocean that are output on that native grid as well. And the three letter identifier is our fantasy about what things mean. They may or may not be self-evident. SFC, surface, RAD, radiation, MST, moist, AER, aerosol, ocean, ocean, that kind of thing, ice, sea ice, et cetera. But so the sample file name is gonna have that three digit identifier and then will include an experiment number and the month and, and day, for instance, for a monthly average. Okay, um, so GMAO S2S2, the file specification document is online and available. And we do have an FTP site for files that have already been staged. And I think Amita in her demonstration has downloaded some files from here and done some calculations that she'll show you how to do. GSS to S3, the file specification document is in preparation. We are scurrying around to get that thing done. And um, we are gonna have FTP access for files that have been staged in a slightly different location. Um, and so now I talked about this file specification document that we're gonna prepare. In addition to general information about the grid, the file naming convention, uh, for every one of our collections, it contains this entry that includes the variable name, the dimensions, and the units, okay? Um, and so this is a little bit more detail than what you would get from that collection specification that, that I talked about before. So again, S2S2, all of this is out there and available for people to have a look at. In general, S2S3 is outputting more, many more collections and fields than what S2S2 did. In particular, the prognostic fields are all the same, you know, what we're predicting, the temperature, the humidity, things like that. We have a lot of diagnostic fields that are present in this system. 
in the S2S3 system. Okay, so that's about all for my uh, part of the talk. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, and so the GMAO and the GSS2S forecast output availability is basically we have different assorted ways of reaching out, of getting stuff staged for users, uh, get in touch. We're also sort of a nimble system, and so specialized requests for specialized fields are, you know, we're perfectly um, happy to do that. For a user that's interested in what our retrospective forecast skill of a particular field that they're interested in, we're, we're also more than happily willing to provide that. So, um, we can we can answer some questions later. In the meantime, let's pass this back to Amita so she can do the the uh, the demo using the S2S data. Thank you so much, Andrea, for the excellent presentation and information about the S2S prediction system. Next, we are going to have a brief demonstration of um, how to access and analyze S2S data. Um, so to get S2S data for a specific period, it's either historical or present, um, the data are available, and, but you have to request them. Uh, you can send an email to Dr. Mollard uh, with the um, period of your interest, and uh, the data will be um, extracted from the GMO repository and put on um, an FTP site uh, from where you can download the data. So this FTP site, if you go there now, uh, you will see some data sets uh, staged there in response to users' requests. Uh, these are also all open source data. So if you are interested in using them, if happen to be the same data set or same period, you can download and use this data. Otherwise, you can request the data. So next, there are two demonstrations that we want to show. The first one is that we will examine maps of atmospheric anomalies uh, to identify areas of dry or wet and warm and cold conditions. So uh, for next nine months, how things are going to evolve is what is available in these uh, pre-calculated uh, maps uh, that we will look at. And then next, we will examine surface temperature and precipitation predictions for next three months based on the most recent forecast uh, made available by Dr. Mollard from uh, S2S data repository. So let's start with this atmospheric anomalies. Um, this page has a lot of information uh, about S2S home. Um, as uh, Dr. Mollard mentioned, S2S version 3 will be out soon and this website might be even easier to navigate, but we're going to focus on uh, this S2S 2.1 system uh, that's available here. Um, this, if you can see, uh, this starts in June um, 2024 ensemble mean um, and goes all the way to February of next year. So um, the nine months of forecast based on May initial condition. Uh, here you will see variable. So that two meter atmospheric temperature is available and precipitation. Um, so anomalies are available. And here uh, you can pick regions, either global, uh, North and South America, uh, Southeast Asia, Australia, and Europe. So you can zoom into any of these. Um, and um, to pick, um, so let's just stay with temperature anomaly and look at the global uh, uh, maps first. You can submit here. We already have it. You can, let's look at the July ensemble mean. If you click on it, you can zoom in. Here's um, the color bar with anomalies. So all uh, blues are negative and uh, reds are positive anomalies, as you can see in, in degrees Celsius. Um, clearly in July, we see that here in in southern and eastern U.S., it's quite warm, warmer. Um, temperature anomalies are there in Mexico, in Central America, all the way to Brazil. You can see um, warmer anomalies. Similarly, in the southern part of Africa, something that um, Sean was uh, showing last session, here you have uh, positive 
uh, warmer temperatures in in higher latitudes in western india in australia uh, everywhere you see um, warmer than normal uh, t 2m or 2 meter temperature if you go to august it persists here almost everywhere um, here also uh, if you go to western india i think after monsoon rain it's uh, the mid cool down and maybe anomalies are not that strong if you go down all the way to say january february of next year uh, you can see that winter time temperatures are much warmer over the us um, in in january and february and uh, you you can see uh, where there are negative anomalies so it's colder than normal as in uh, north um, western australia as you can see here so this allows you to quickly browse through what's going to happen in next uh, nine months you can get qualitative idea by looking at this maps that um, it's going to be warmer colder similarly you can look at precipitation uh, let's focus more on uh, the if you look at the global map, you will see that most anomalies are stronger over the oceanic region, especially this ITCZ region. So if you want to look at land, it's best to focus on one of these areas. And I'm going to pick South America and then submit. So here, uh, this is again monthly anomalies from June, July, August, all the way to uh, February. And as you can see, um, there is deficit of rainfall. These are negative anomalies um, in in the northern part of uh, South Am South America. As you go down to uh, southern hemisphere uh, summer, so say in January February, um, Brazil develops or shows deficit in rainfall. It starts developing these anomalies and then you can see these large areas covered in negative anomalies or deficit of rainfall so here is how you can actually look at different continents and get some idea of what might be happening it here it's about normal um, in in their summer months uh, so um, also you will find information about um, s2s system here um, and a lot of other information that you can uh, browse through. So in the next exercise, we are actually going to calculate anomalies of surface temperatures and precipitation uh, using QGIS. Um, if you have not yet installed QGIS on your computer, uh, you can go ahead and do that after this exercise is over. Um, your prerequisite did request you to install QGIS on your computer. So for this analysis or calculations of anomalies, I have downloaded monthly forecast data for July, August and September of this year. Uh, these are ensemble mean forecasts um, and uh, uh, also, what I've downloaded is so-called drift files with respect to which anomalies are calculated. All these files are available to you to download uh, from the training webpage. Um, and uh, these files are in NetCDF format that we will be opening in QGIS and calculating uh, anomalies next. So I have, I'm going to open a new project uh, just for your information, uh, the version I'm using is QGIS 3.16.14. Once you open a new project, uh, we're going to go down here to coordinate. Uh, in this window, we're just going to type world. And you will get continental outlines with all the country shape files also outlined here. And if you want to see which country you're looking at, you can go here, identify features, click here and zoom into region of your interest and click. And it tells you in this window uh, which country you're looking at. In this case, it is Zimbabwe um, or Brazil. And you can click on the country and uh, you can see the country outline. Now, um, 
the data that available to you are global data. So we are going to look at global data, but what you can do is zoom into the region of your interest and uh, then just focus on that. So let's start uh, by adding uh, data to it. So I'm going to add raster. So let's see, I'm going to demonstrate a calculation of anomalies for July, and then you can do it uh, for August and September um, at your convenience. You will have some time after this exercise to work on that, or you can do it uh, at your convenience later this week as well. So let's start with precipitation July 24 at CDF file. Uh, open that and add. So this file is added. Now I also want to point out something that if when you load this file um, and for some reason if it does not appear where the map is what you will have to do is click on control click on the raster go to uh, layer CRS because this is a net CDF file there is no CRS attached to it so you will have to pick a geographic CRS and that is EPSG 4326 so once you click on that if the map and data are not appearing at the same location, they should after you do that. So you can click on the file and go to properties and look at information. Um, this is an extent of this file is given here in longitude and latitude. So it is global data as you can see. Uh, width and height, which is eastward and northward, north-south grid points, 720 by 361. So this is half a degree data, global. Then, uh, of course, it's the format and data statistics are available here. Minimum, maximum values, mean and standard deviation. Uh, most importantly, you can see the units here. It's in kilograms per meter square per second. If you remember, just a few minutes ago, we looked at the Atmospheric Anomalies website. Uh, the precipitation data were in millimeters per day. So to be consistent with that, I've converted this data in uh, millimeter per day. And uh, just a quick conversion is that if you have precipitation in kilograms per meter square per second to get the column of water uh, in millimeter, First of all, you will divide it by water density, which is about 1000 kilograms per meter cube. And so if you if you divide by 1000, you will get uh, precipitation in meters per second. And to convert it to millimeters per second, you will have to um, multiply it by uh, 1000. And so this you are dividing and multiplying by 1000. So basically what it says is that when you have precipitation in kilograms per meter square per second, actually it is millimeters per second. The same values will you will get that. Then you multiply by number of seconds uh, per uh, hour uh, and hours per day. So click here on the layer and go to raster calculator. Uh, you can select the raster and multiply it by um, number of seconds per hour and number of hours per day. And I have already uh, saved this file. Y you can create that and then say OK. And now you will see uh, numbers look, compare this in kilograms per meter square per second and this is in millimeter uh, per day so you can remove this if you like and keep the layer which is millimeters per day let's uh, set symbology so we can see values go to properties go to symbology here you will uh, pick single band pseudo color and I would say 0 0.5 to say about 60 um, we can pick that here in the labels it should 
be maybe significant to two decimal points and you can have more intervals here so equal intervals and then how many classes you want you can see that and then you can invert this so that you can have lower values for blue and higher for red and say okay and you will see the um, the data here now what i'm going to do is click on the world map go to properties and uh, select just simple outline rather than shaded uh, continents so you can just see the outline and the data so now you can see the data and you can zoom into the re region of your interest and uh, see what the precipitation structure uh, looks like for month of July. You can see that numbers here say over the US, um, maximum rainfall is more like 2025. So you will have to change uh, colors to be able to see the structure. So you go to property, uh, go to symbology and change the range here. Uh, let's see, I'm going to say 15 and say okay and now you can see that uh, you can see more structure uh, so precipitation you may have to change and reduce the range even further if you are interested in any of these uh, regions now i have already pre-calculated uh, precipitation and uh, temperature anomalies for july 24 so we are going to walk through those steps now so again for precipitation uh, july prediction ensemble mean that we just saw um, i have loaded in this project uh, the highest value here the range is up to 50 millimeters per day next file that we have is this drift file for the same month this is you can consider this as a long-term mean so anomalies are found with respect to this file so when we want to find anomalies we take actual prediction and subtract this drift uh, uh, file precipitation from that and so that's what we've done so for that go to raster calculator select july precipitation prediction and subtract the precipitation from the long-term mean or drift file so select that and then you can select name of the uh, output layer uh, and save it on your computer which i already have so once you put that file name in you can say okay and then you will get a new raster which is uh, precipitation anomalies and that's what is shown here so first of all this is actual uh, July prediction and this is this is prediction this is drift file pre precipitation and these are anomalies and if you look at the scale here it's minus two to two millimeters per day uh, so anything that is very dark blue it's uh, deficit either minus two or less and red is plus two or more uh, more precipitation it's wetter so you can zoom into the region of your interest um, here you can see that uh, parts of canada in the central us um, in colombia northern brazil and southern brazil there is rainfall deficit for july 24. if you move on to uh, southeast asia uh, china there are parts of uh, these areas where deficit of rainfall is there if you zoom in a little more uh, Bhutan parts of Nepal and Eastern India also have less rain than expected or than normal um, so you can look at that I have calculated temperature anomalies as well so let's start by looking at um, July prediction of surface temperatures and scale shown here is uh, 205 to 315 Kelvin uh, warmer tropics and colder as you go away from the tropics the next file is the the drift data for for surface temperature so you can see that this is actual prediction and this is drift actual prediction and drift for july and when you subtract uh, that to find anomalies 
you get temperature anomalies uh, and the values here here are uh, minus 5 to 5 uh, Kelvin or degree Celsius it's the same now you can see that um, parts of the US are warmer Canada again Brazil Greenland many regions have warmer than normal temperatures and wherever you see green and blue colors that's where the, it's colder than normal so now you can analyze both together uh, precipitation and temperature the regions which are um, drier and warmer are shown here either in the u.s in the south america in brazil this is for month of july now the files available to you are for august and september also so all the units are uh, converted into millimeters per day you don't have to do that um, and anomalies are also calculated so all these files are available to you uh, all you have to do is um, just load these rasters in qgis zoom into the region of your interest change symbology to look at the patterns and see how you progress from july august september how it, it the temperatures are changing and precipitation are changing in the forecast and that will give you some idea of what's unfolding in next uh, two to three months uh, so uh, that concludes our exercise or demonstration um, for today so with these demonstrations uh, we conclude today's session uh, so just to summarize uh, we had an overview of s2s prediction system and we also looked at how to analyze uh, data uh, gmao seasonal prediction group they use coupled earth system models and analyze in conjunction with satellite and in situ observations to study and predict phenomena that evolve on subseasonal to decadal time scales s2s prediction is not same as weather prediction as dr mollard explained it's a set statistical approach where ensembles of forecasts are needed to predict probabilities multiple uses of s2s data are already there uh, they include uh, drought forecasting and water resources forecasting, uh, studying dust sources in the US, soil moisture, precipitation and temperature uh, prediction for landslide prediction, uh, ecological forecasting and data to drive a pest model. Data for users are tailored and distributed uh, from an FTP site. They have to be requested. Uh, maps of 2 meter temperature and precipitation monthly anomaly predictions for 9 months are available from the, the GMAO site that we just saw. Um, also examples of ensemble mean predictions of surface temperature and precipitation anomalies were analyzed in QGIS. We looked at the month of July. Uh, you can look at August and September to see where dry and warm conditions might persist over uh, next two to three months and specific data can be requested by contacting dr andrea mollot and her email address is available here now next part three will focus on overview of nasa earth exchange global daily downscale projections or next gddp for the coupled model intercomparison project phase six cmip six so we will look at how to access and analyze next GDDP CMIP6 climate projections. We'll look at precipitation and temperature and see how long-term drought conditions will evolve under climate change. A note about homework and certificates. There will be one homework assignment and that will open on 1st of August and that can be accessed from the training webpage. Answers must be submitted via Google Forms and the homework due date is 15th of August. Those who attend all four live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline will receive a certificate of completion uh, in approximately two months after the training is over. 
With that, we want to thank Dr. Andrea Mollard. Uh, Andrea, thank you so much for your time and for the excellent presentation about S2S prediction system. Also want to thank you for making the data available to us uh, for analysis. Here is the RSET website link and we are on the social media and these are our sister programs you can look into. And that brings us to the end of today's session. So um, I, I hope you were able to work a little bit on the exercise. Uh, and now uh, we can go to question and answers. Um, I'm going to go through all the questions one by one and see how many we can address. We have Dr. Mollard uh, and she will be answering these questions some of, uh, about S2S system. So question one, I'm to start Andrea and you can um, answer these questions. Will the GEOS S2S 3's uh, Hindcast Climatology Spanning 1991 to 2020 also be released in August? So you can unmute yourself and just verbally answer the question, Andrea. As I wrote here, the answer is yes. Um, frankly, we here at NASA, as in many more, many, many places now in the government, we're fully committed to this open science. Any data that we produce should be available to the public. Our only obstacle is having enough public facing file space to get everything out there. So the answer is yes. This is not that extensive a data set compared to others. We have access to something that we call a data portal. We're working out how to do that and we will make that URL public. And we'll have a little readme in our on our website about how to how to access the data through the data portal. Thank you. Question two is also for you. How long will GEOS S2S version two be available after the release of version three? Yeah, we're gonna keep it running probably till end of calendar year. Um, we have a user that that one user in particular that needs um, that needs this to be running for a while because they need to download every single one of our ensembles through the whole retrospective forecast period. And that's going to take quite some time. So we're going to keep S2S2 running for them. The plots on our website and a lot of, and the data that are going to a lot of our individual users are going to flip over to be from S2S3 either next month or the month after. Nice. Question three is, what are the possible ways to get the ensemble to look good if it is not? Right. So this is the calibration that I talked about. So we generate the ensemble and we do some sort of calibration. Frankly, we remove the drift. That's the simplest calibration that you can think of. But, um, you know, this gives us essentially an unbiased anomaly. There are many other methods out there. Um, the National Multimodal Ensemble, for instance, applies a, uh, a rescaling of the variance as well. Um, and there are many, many, many different machine learning based methods out there and still under development. So this is an open question for how to adjust the ensemble. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, we're again, we're doing and advising the simplest one, but certainly there are many options out there. Great, thank you. Question four, is GEOS S2S an open access model? Can I use it for Kazakhstan? So a couple of things. One is the output is global. So if somebody is looking to use the output from our forecast over Kazakhstan, then they should be able to. It seems that, that there may be an issue of resolution, horizontal resolution related to that, but certainly it's available. In terms of somebody else running the model, we're an open access model only in the sense that anybody can download the code. We have it up on Zenodo, we have it up on a couple of different, you know, version control, SVN and Git and a few different ways to download it. But in a practical sense, it needs parallel computing to run at any reasonable resolution. So some kind of a, a cluster. And there's a lot of auxiliary data that that reside on the NASA computing machines that we need to run it. 
And so in a practical sense, it's, it's very difficult for somebody to run it somewhere else. We have options to run it um, at the two NASA computing centers. Um, we're also not a, a community model in the sense that some others are where there's a whole office full of people to provide help on how to download and run things. So yes and no is the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. Uh, question five is, can the GEOS S2S model be applied to local scale, small scale studies? What is the special resolution of its output? Yeah, so our model runs, it doesn't run on a Latlon grid, but we interpolate our output to a 50 kilometer Latlon grid for atmospheric fields, temperature, precipitation, things like that. 25 kilometer ocean resolution, sea surface temperature, sea surface salinity, and any you know, fields at depth in the ocean. We provide it 25 kilometers. In order to get something at smaller scales, you'd need to go through some kind of downscaling exercise. There are a few users around that take our output and do downscaling, but what they're doing is very specific to their specific downscaling application. I don't have any kind of sort of general recommendation. This is how you would downscale in general for all uses. So that's something that, that would have to get worked out. There are dynamical and, and statistical downscaling methods out there. That's not maybe as useful as you would like, but I, I don't have a better answer for that. So yes, we'll, in next session, we will have one statistical method that you can learn about from next GDDP. That's the uh, downscaling effort. But as Andrea said, it's really, uh, you have to be sure that for your specific application and region, it's applicable. I think downscaling is a whole um, area of research and application. So uh, question six, are S2S um, 2.1 maps available for download as GeoTIFF? So no, um, what we've got is we, look, we upload a bunch of .png images on our website that somebody could grab but that's a very limited number of fields and there's nothing in, in Geotep. Um, I would imagine if we found some kind of very broad use for this, we could find some way to get this done. But as of now, the answer is no. So question seven is how do you check for Africa? So again, the, the model is global. The data are, are global. My understanding is that some of the demonstrations may have been for us or something but but certainly africa is um part of of any of the global fields so that should just be included when you download data yes um, so the data you have uh the sample data to work with they have it's global so you should be able to look at africa zoom in Mm -hmm. And the question eight is, can they be viewed, use, uh, so um, this is about data file, can they be viewed using Panop license, it's NetCTF, and answer is yes, you can open these files in, in Panoply. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Question nine, is there a Python notebook you could recommend for this exercise for people not expert in QGIS? I can't help with this. I'm yeah. wondering if one of you guys can. So, um, I mean, that is a good question. Um, we probably will uh, think of that um, instead of QGIS, uh, slowly switch to Python and notebook based uh, calculations. So we'll definitely take the, this suggestion in, in, you know, for our team to work on. Yes, we'll do that. Right now we don't have it, but this is something that we can think about. Question 10. It, it is very interesting to me that the forecast predictions are listed as ensembles. The, this leads me to uh, ask this specific question. What specific motive or patterns are within this forecast prediction and exist across North America for landslides? This answer is a very long winded way to say, I, I don't know. But there are people that either are still or were using our output specifically to look at landslides. And I can't remember exactly who, but I can find out quickly and I could answer, you know, in whatever format you guys would like. 
but I think this question gets posed to them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if, if we can, you know, find out who is using, maybe we can uh, ask this question to them. There's somebody in the hydrology branch and I just can't remember who. Okay. Okay. Definitely we'll look at that. And, uh, question 11, what are some examples of custom data requests that get uploaded to FTP? Yeah, so we have some of the FTP fields that you'll find there are coarser resolution, because there are some multi-model ensemble um, groups that want everything at the same resolution, so we course in our fields. Others just want subsets because they're working like at a university or at a small place that can't handle huge amounts of data. Um, other things that are, we, we do like a little calculation for them on the fly. One example of this is there's an atmospheric river intercomparison project that we contribute to that the California water resources folks use. And we do a calculation from our outputted moisture and momentum fields, the winds, to perform what they call an integrated moisture transport and then upload that to them. So, and there are a few examples of little calculations that we make just on the fly, um, horizontal interpolations. Most of the, most of it comes under either subsetting horizontal interpolation or little calculations. Great, thank you. Um, next question is, one question related to the seasonal forecast. Is there any long-term or 30-year or longer daily data set of historical variables like air temperature and precipitation? I, I'm interpreting this question not as is there a long-term observational data set, but is there a long-term record from our forecasts? And the answer to that is we produce three hourly fields of two meter temperature and precipitation um, or all, all the model levels of precipitation um, and then average them later for seasonal forecasts to monthly averages or so. So it's a lot of data, but certainly at the request of user, we could give these three hourly fields for the ensemble members. Now, um, I would be very wary to give daily fields out or three hourly fields out for anything beyond the first 45 days at most of the forecast, because beyond that, the daily fields are just not predictable. And so I would have a hard time standing behind them. Given this, if somebody wants them anyway, of course it's available, data are public and they can just have them. Um, but we have these three hourly fields for the new forecasts, but also we have them for our entire record of retrospectives. It's a lot of data, but yes, there's a record and a user can ask for it. Um, great. Uh, question 13 is the anomaly layer shown for July for precipitation. There are some areas, countries in South America and Middle Eastern countries that were white, uh, which represents zero anomaly. What is the reason for that? I do not think not having a deficit would be the reason. So the white color was between 0.4 to 4 millimeters per day, if you go back and look at it. Uh, so anything that was in that range around zero was white. So what it says is that the anomalies were smaller, you know, compared to uh, the mean. So what we saw was more like, um, above minus one and plus one, they were colored, um, lighter color between 0.4 and those numbers. So white color basically shows that the anomalies are they're not zero, they are around zero, hovering around zero, between minus 0.4 to um, four, 0.4 to minus 0.4 to plus 0.4. And you can change that range. That's what uh, I was talking about, that uh, if you change symbology, uh, you can do that that range you can change. What you want to keep white or you don't want to keep anything white. Uh, question 14. Yeah, just, I yeah. would just add to that a note that I wrote there. This only means that the expected rainfall is the usual amount. Yes. That usual amount is the number that appears in that drift file. So if you want to know exactly how much rainfall there is, you could go to that drift file and see, because what we're telling you is that that's the number that we're expecting the next month or the month after. 
Yeah, so actually, you know, that's something, that's a great point that I actually wanted to make when we were going through the exercise is that, you know, if uh, wherever you see anomaly, the anomaly is num those numbers should be compared to like what the actual rain is like in drift, right? So that you can see how, what's the percent percentage deficit there is uh, compared to long-term mean, or, you know, in this case, this drift. So yeah, that's a good point. Um, so it, it it's it's um, more or less normal with respect to that drift data that you have the white color. So next uh, question is it was a little bit too fast to follow the calculation. So yes, the um, it's just the kilogram per meter square per second precipitation. Uh, it's equivalent to millimeter per second, and so you multiply. A number of seconds in day and you get millimeter per day so but the files that you have they are already converted so you don't have to go through that step question 15 is do you only produce precipitation and temperature data under geos s2s yeah we have quite an extensive list of output fields we are predicting the winds the temperature the humidity as well as all kinds of what we would call diagnostic fields surface radiation, all kinds of things like that. That document, um, we, we call that our file specification document, provides every the whole list for GS S2S2. The S2S3 output is going to be totally reorganized into different groupings and things like that. We're preparing that document now, but it's you can imagine that it's at least this field, these fields plus quite a, quite a number more, quite a few more. Great, thank you. Question 16 is, while performing exercise part one, I encountered some error in GEE. Can someone guide who I can contact to correct those errors? Um, I think you can email it to us, um, please. Yeah, email um, to our set email address, and then uh, so we'll forward it to Sean McCartney or anybody else who can answer your question. Question 17 is, as the forecast provides data on the anomalies, how do you use that data to calculate drought indices like SPI? So, um, yeah, go ahead, Andrea. So that's an interesting question because the reason that we do all of these anomalies and things like that is that provides the reliability of the forecast, the correspondence between the error and the spread. Um, when you're computing a particular statistic or, or a particular index, there are a few different ways to do it. Certainly, you could take the raw uncalibrated output and compute the SPI and do the same from the hindcasts. And so you would have an SPI anomaly more than, you know, higher than usual, et cetera. But there are a few other options that one could think of. Um, and so that would be something to reach out to us, please, and we'll try to figure something out. You know, the idea would be to try a few different options and see which one provides you the most skillful forecast of SPI. Great, that's, that's great to know. Uh, question 18 is, I was wondering if there is any package in R that allows us to download GMAO S2S data. So, uh, Andrea, I think that probably there isn't a package that would allow you to download GMAO S2S data. You have to request them uh, to be staged on an FTP site. Yeah, either grab what we have or request that, that they be staged, or there is some stuff that we're going to put on that data portal. And, and again, as we finalize all of this, we'll let people know. Yeah, question 19. Do we need to perform the raster calculations to convert units? And no, for for the files you have for this exercise, you, you don't have to convert any units. They are already converted. If you are interested, if you if you download data from the FTP site and you want to convert the units, you, you will have to do the raster calculation. So question 20, I cannot download the anomalies. Um, 
I'm not sure uh, this is the GMAO S2S2 current. Um, Andrea, do you recognize that question? Question 20? I, I see I see the question, but I'm not quite sure that I understand what somebody is trying to do. So this is the yeah, this is the atmospheric anomalies page, I believe, and those are PNG images, so I'm not yeah, sure. Points. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you, they, they're not digital data. So that way, you you know, one of the previous questions answered that, that we cannot download as digital data. Uh, question 21, what is the best scale to work with this data set in the forecast? Um, not sure what, what you mean by scale, uh, if you can be more specific. Where can I get VPD data for 2000 to 2020? It would have to be calculated from temperature and humidity. Uh, what's the chronological, yeah, uh, entry the answering arrangement of the layers? So we, we interpolate our data from model levels to pressure levels to provide mm -hmm. output and their sequence bottom to top, but the um, the metadata in the NetCDF file should tell you which level is is which. Question twenty, um, yeah, twenty five. Are there any further recommendations to consider when modeling seasonal uh, drought, such as uh, parameters, scales, and data? Um, I am not an expert on drought prediction, um, so this is not a, a question for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a reader of the papers on the subject, so I know that there are lots of different ways to measure, you know, the different kinds of drought, the agricultural drought, the meteorological drought, et cetera. Um, so I, I don't know how to answer this question. So, Andrea, I had a question about that. Uh, is does S two S version two or three will have surface soil moisture? Yep, we have soil moisture. So okay. certainly, you know, that's that's one of the parameters that mm -hmm. would be downloaded. We actually okay. have a three soil moisture levels. Mm -hmm. We have a surface soil moisture, a root zone, and a a, oh, a deep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So all of those are available. So, so I think. Um, uh, not about the scale, I'm not sure, but if you look at uh, precipitation, surface temperature, soil moisture, then you will have a good idea about um, meteorological and also agricultural drought uh, based on uh, these data sets. So at least that you can look at um, seasonal anomalies you can look at if you um, want to know seasonal droughts. We, we are particularly um, pleased with our soil moisture initialization methodology. Um, frankly, it was developed here quite some time ago, and now other centers are starting to adapt this method. But um, our soil moisture initial conditions are better than many. Great. So I interpret scales means temporal scale, that if you want to look at seasonal drought, do you use daily data to begin with? But you can use monthly data, right? To, to look at seasonal evolution. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So question. Um, yeah, go ahead. Please. One, one caveat for this that I just want to have clear, which is we do not have any mechanism as our model is running to know about any irrigation that's being done. So all of our soil moisture and drought predictions will be as though that's not happening, but that's mm -hmm. certainly not accurate. So as of now, it's being worked on, but as of now, we have no mechanism for adjusting our soil moisture based on irrigation. Yeah. So just the natural part is included, not the management part is not there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So question 26 is how can S2S output be used for statistical downscaling, for instance, using climate predictability tool, given that uh, is provided at course resolution? 
I'm not going to go anywhere near that. Yeah, I think, you know, our downscaling is a big issue and um, that a lot of work's been going on. So we can provide you some references and um, next session we will look at um, what uh, GDDP, NASA GDDP, they use for uh, daily downscaling data. Um, they have a statistical methodology, so you can start with that, and then there are a number of references in there too. So, the the severe folks are also employing some kind of a downscaling method that, frankly, I am not excited by, but it's working for them. Okay. Um, and question 27 is evapotranspiration data available on products generated by uh, S2S? That's a yes. Oh, great. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. We have actually, it, it, we have some breakdown. We have total evapotranspiration. We've got, and it's broken down what comes from the soil, what comes from the leaves, what come, you know, like that, what comes from the plants. So we've got transpiration. Um, what they call interception reservoir evaporation. So it's, yeah. So the answer is yes. And it's further broken down by what part of the uh, vegetation it comes from. This is fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Andrea, for the presentation and being here to answer all these questions. So thank you for your time. Your expertise on this topic has helped us a lot. And um, hopefully um, everybody will be able to use S2S uh, with a little more ease now that you know more about data and systems and how to request the data and how to analyze the data. So I think um, if we do not have any more questions, we still have a, a few minutes if you have any questions. But in the meantime, I want to thank our speaker, Dr. Andrea Mollard, one more time. Uh, for her time and effort and great help with this topic. We also want to thank our RSET team members, our coordinate, coordinators, um, Natasha Thompson Griffin and Sarah Kutschel, uh, also helped by Brock Levins and uh, Selwyn Hudson Odoi. Um, I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Sean McCartney and uh, Susan Monty for helping uh, with this training. Um, and thank you all for attending today's session. Um, you can work on the exercise at your convenience. And if you have any questions, you can uh, let us know or you can send an email. And uh, we'll see you uh, next week on Tuesday, that is 30th of July. Um, and at that time, we will have a presentation about uh, NASA's uh, its, uh, daily downscale data for multiple models. Uh, global climate models, and also we will uh, look at an exercise on how to analyze this data in Google Earth Engine. So if you don't have any further questions, um, we will see you on Tuesday on 30th of July for the next session.